Um, so really, it, it's not a threat, and also using mutex to resolve these race conditions um, to protect the concurrent execution from the get-go, it's not an easy task, um, especially if, if you know, programmers are asked to do this kind of design. Uh, it's very hard to um, you know, have a, a proper design that's error-free and also support the, the max level of concurrency. Um, really, the main purpose of using multi-threading is to ensure that the tasks can be carried out concurrently uh, to improve the um, resource utilization, to reduce the, um, the latency, uh, reduce, you know, eliminate the, the blocking time. So that's the purpose of using multi-thread, multi-threaded programs. But uh, in this design process, uh, using thread functions and using um, mutex locks, even semaphores are not a um, easy tool that you can always uh, get, get you the right solution. Uh, it requires a lot of um, thinking behind it. Um, so this makes people think, um, you know, it's, is the concurrency itself uh, intrinsically hard um, or it's some other issues. Um, there are a lot of, uh, in the physical world, um, concurrency is always there. Um, so there are always people doing things concurrently as in individuals. And um, when you operate machines, drive cars, you, you know, do things concurrently. Uh, so uh, in the physical world, um, things, uh, seems to go well, even there are a lot of concurrencies. So the concurrency itself uh, is natural. Um, you know, the, what, it's the threads that's really hard. When we write threads, we think about sequential process, but these sequential processes, they share a memory. Um, from the perspective of any thread, the entire state of the universe can change between two atomic actions. Um, so that's where the, the problem is hard because any threat can change the entire state that every other threat sees. Um, and that's where um, the problems may arise. Now with mutex, uh, it, um, you know, to be honest, I, I can't uh, really get the sense from this picture, but although it's included in the uh, picture from the uh, Professor Lee's slides, uh, but I think what he tries to say that using uh, mutexes, uh, it's um, one way of getting us calm in this, you know, turbulent and dangerous uh, environment, uh, at least we have a, um, f you know, a tool that's uh, within our reach can help us to uh, resolve some of the issues. But still, it doesn't mean that um, that's always a, you know, a beautiful solution. Uh, if you don't design a, um, the threads in the proper, um, you know, thinking if you don't think hard where we should protect the shared variables, where we should avoid risk conditions, where we should you know, enforce the orders, if you don't think about this while you're using thread, you will very likely to get any, um, you get troubles uh, you, because of them. Um, I wanna introduce one, the other, one other solution uh, is to use so-called message passing. Um, Message passing um, is a bit different uh, from what we saw earlier. Um, what we have here is a um, um, producer and consumer function. And uh, we have um, 
we create two threads, one is perceived user, one is consumer. Uh, what we want to do is we will uh, have a producer's thread that will send the um, variables, the new values to the consumer threads. Uh, so one producer is sending and the one consumer is always receiving. And there are two, um, you know, in the main function, the thread create, thread join of what we saw earlier. Um, but in this thread functions, um, the main distinction from the earlier design is this send function and this get function. So the send function and get function are um, the ways we pass the variables between these instances. Um, we um, don't have really the share variable that we have to protect. Uh, instead, we use send and receive, which underneath they will build a channel to ensure the um, passing of these variables. Because you can see here, there's no you know, shared variable called a value that you need to um, you know, pass around. Um, but there's still risk of deadlock and uh, un, uh, expected uh, non-determinism um, if we don't do it properly. So that's why I want to show you uh, the send and the get function here. Um, send on the left side is the send function, on the right side is the get function. So what we are trying to do is using the send function, the producer can um, send um, new messages, new variables and to um, the um, consumer side, or consumer side will use get function to retrieve the data. Um, very similar um, design inside the send, uh, where you can see we create a link list. Um, different from earlier the link list, on this link list we, we use um, the, uh, the, the variables itself, the messages as the payload. So every node carries a new message, new value, and um, being added to the end of the link list. And uh, let's see, uh, we will, we have a few things, um, you know, so mutex lock, mutex unlock, that's where you will um, uh, protect the, uh, this critical section. And the other thing uh, we have here is this condition signal and uh, um, P threat condition weight, P threat condition signal. Now this here is, um, is something new that we, we should uh, talk a bit more about. This P threat condition is essentially a, um, a, a semaphore that, that's used here to indicate uh, what the um, variable is uh, gonna be, um, well, which, which, um, which thread should be, um, should be waiting or which thread should proceed. Um, so let's use this get as an example. So we first will try to see, so get function tries to um, find new values from, um, from this link list because the send function will put new values on this link list. So the get function, as you can see here, we're trying to um, you know, get the first payload, that's the message from the head, from the first node on the link list. And then we move on to the next one and then free the element. But before we do that, we'll have to do one thing. That is to check the size. We'll check the size. And the way we check it is to say, okay, it, do, do we have size equal to zero? If we have size zero, that means we don't have uh, any new um, message on the link list, we will call this P threat condition wait. Now it takes two, um, two uh, arguments. First is the sent, and that's one of the condition variables. And the next one is the mutex. 
And this is the mutex is the lock that we acquired earlier. Now this gets interesting because normally if you don't, don't you, if you do lock, nobody else can get this lock until release. So that's the unlock is for. But with the P thread condition weight, what it does is to, um, it will um, release the lock momentarily and it will um, be waiting on this scent, on this uh, condition variable. So when this mutex, this lock is released temporarily, so there's a chance that the send function will be able to get this lock. And that's really when uh, the send message is called, the send function is called, indicating the, um, the producer wants to send a new message onto the linked list. So in that moment, this lock will be uh, acquired and then uh, this send function will be able to put a new message on the linked list. Then it will signal that back to uh, this weight condition. So this, this part of the code, this, this get function will be waken up um, and we will, um, this thread will be waken up, um, but it will still be um, basically um, waiting on this one until uh, this unlock um, API is called. So this API will return after this mutex is all unlocked because it, this thread is being waken up and also this mutex is, mutex is acquired again after the send function released that. And the good news here is the size will now be greater than zero because you know, the send function just increased the size after putting the new message on the link list. Okay, so this get function will move on. It will be able to get the uh, uh, pay payload from the first node of the link list, uh, and then free that and decrement, then unlock. So in this way, send and get function can um, operate fairly efficiently using a shared link list, but avoid um, you know, deadlock um, on it. Okay, so we introduced one solution with the message passing, um, but really the, um, the takeaway message here is um, you know, non-trivial software return with threads um, and semaphore and mutex is incomprehensible uh, to human beings. Uh, you really have to try hard to understand these uh, nuances of concurrent execution using threads and how we can apply mutex and semaphores to um, make them more efficient and avoid uh, deadlocks um, to find a, a good solution. Um, let me see what time is it. So um, let me just proceed um, to finish the next few slides. Do threads have sound foundation? Pardon me? That was a mistake. I was, I was muted. Sorry. Okay. All right. So threads. So let's you know see a little bit more about threads. Um, so. The question was, um, you know, do threads have a sound foundation? So is how we, the way we define threads a, a reasonable uh, definition and why it's so difficult to make it work properly? Um, um, so this is the, uh, uh, the pizza, uh, pizza tower, uh, I think in Italy, um, you know, this whole enterprise is held up by a few threads here. Uh, I think just for you know, precautions. Uh, so it's really um, what we see on the um, thread. So what's the problem? Um, the model of computation is like this. <coughs> We're dealing with um, data, so we can abstract them with zero and ones. And we have a set of finite sequence of bits and we do computation. So we uh, apply this function f and f uh, takes this set b as an input and um, you know the output is um, another um, 
set of based on B. Now we can have compositional functions and we can apply multiple functions. Um, you can do you know, all kind of operations, signal processing to change this zero and ones. And the programs that we design specifies the composition of these computations. Um, so another way to understand what we are trying to say here is that uh, we have um, you know, instructions. Uh, instructions will operate on variables, registers, and you, you may have uh, multiple instructions that you will apply. And um, then eventually you have the whole program. Um, so threads um, actually augment on this model to uh, allow concurrency. But this model does not emit concurrency gracefully. gracefully. The basic sequential computation is what we are used to write programs uh, and uh, it's all, always the case. Um, you know, when you learn programming, you don't learn parallel programming at, at the beginning. So you always think uh, programs are sequence of instructions being executed from the beginning to the end. So what this means is you have an initial state, um, B0, um, and then at every step, you will go through one of the um, functions in the sequence and you will apply this function n uh, on the earlier value of b and you get the new value based on the initial value and the the function that you define so if this is a you know a zero or, uh, you will let's say this function is a, a inverse function then you'll get a one so it depends on what you have in an instruction but you always do this and eventually you have a final state uh, B uh, subscript N if you have N instructions. So for, formally the composition of a computation is a function comp composition. When you have threads, um, you are in trouble. Um, this is really what happens. So this blue thread suspended, um, got suspended at some point um, and you know, its goal, well, it, at that point, uh, it states is um, BN, or it's about to execute BN um, based on BN minus one. But because this instruction was suspended, another thread can be scheduled and the other thread will do a lot of things. And one thing could be changing the state. That means, when the threat one resumes execution, it's now seeing B n minus one. It, it's possibly that becomes B prime n minus one. So this state here, this state here, or this uh, input variable here is now different because the injection or interference or interleave um, the concurrent execution of another threat. So that's, you know, where um, we see the complications come from. Um, you know, we, we have the threads that we can easily use to share variables. And because the threads can uh, execute concurrently, they may change the state. Um, and then we have to deal with that. So the, really the problem is uh, because threads are um, wild, wildly non-deterministic, um, and the programmer's job is to prune away the non-deterministism by using constraints or execution order. Um, for example, you can use mutexes and also you can use um, you know, shared data, eliminating shared data access, uh, such as you know, using object oriented design. Um, there are incremental improvements uh, throughout the years. Um, I, you know, just a, here's just a short list of those. Uh, you can use objects to encapsulate the data uh, accesses. You can use um, you know, enforced coding rules, uh, acquiring logs in the same order and releasing them uh, subsequently. Uh, you can use, for the database, you can use transactions to ensure uh, atomic operations. Um, you can use MapReduce to um, divide the bigger problem into smaller ones then aggregate the results. 
Uh, you can use formal checking, sorry, formal verification to do model checking to prove your program uh, will uh, behave correctly. So there are a lot of different things that people have been trying to uh, resolve the problem or address the challenges in using multi-threaded um, programs, designing multi-threaded programs.